So, uh, bonjour, Madame la Présidente uh, et Messieurs les Commissaires. Mon nom est Patsy Thompson. I'm the Director General of the Directorate of Environmental and Radiation Protection and Assessment. With me today are Ms. Kay Klassen, Senior Project Officer in the Waste and Decommissioning Division. Ms. Klassen is responsible for this project. And with uh, Ms. Kaiser Francis, the EA Assessment Specialist responsible for this project. We also have uh, a number of people on our technical review team that are present today to uh, help us respond to any questions from the Commission. They're Christina Dotkin, a Radiation Protection Specialist, Ms. Melanie Rickard, a Dosimetry Specialist, Mr. Michael Jones, an Environmental Program Officer, Mr. Dan Pappas, Management System Specialist, as well as Dr. Felicity Harrison, a Senior Human Factor Specialist, all within the CNSC. The presentation will summarize CNSC staff's response to the panel's request for information on the relevance of the two events that occurred at the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIP, in New Mexico, and the relevance for the DGR project. The results of CNSC staff's review of OPG's response to the same request, as well as staff's assessment of the impact of these events on our assessment and recommendations in our 2013 panel member documents on OPG's environmental impact statement and license application. Before I pass the presentation to Ms. Klassen, I would like to mention that we do not yet have all of the information on the root causes and other causes that led to the incidents at the WIP. We will continue to review information for operational experience from a regulatory point of view. So in short, the information we will be pre presenting today represents the information that is available as of essentially a couple of weeks ago. So I will now ask Ms. Klassen to continue with the presentation. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the Joint Review Panel. My name is Kay Klassen. Briefly, in March of this year, the panel asked OPG and the CNSC for information on the importance of the events that had occurred at the WIP facility and its relation to the DGR project. The request was for a description of each of the two events that occurred in February 2014 and the relevance of each event to safety for the proposed DGR project and how the events fell within the assessments of accidents, malfunctions, and malevolent acts for OPG's proposed DGR. The first event occurred at about 10.48 in the morning on February 5th, 2014. The driver of a vehicle used to haul salt underground noticed a fire in his vehicle. He attempted to extinguish it and then notified maintenance of the occurrence. While several people arrived to help the driver with the fire, the facility operator sounded the emergency alarm and announced an evacuation. The operator completed a number of acti activities following the alarm, including changing the ventilation to filter, changing fans, initiating emergency management, suspending surface activities, and activating the mine rescue teams. The first evacuated underground workers arrived at ground surface just after 11 a.m. and the last made it to sur surface a short time later with the underground staff all accounted for shortly before um, 11.35. By 17.22 in that afternoon, the mine rescue teams had re-entered the underground to ensure the vehicle fire was extinguished and to perform other checks. The last team exited around 1 a.m. on February 6th, and the emergency was declared ended. With normal underground activities halted, the investigation of the event and recovery activities were begun. The second event, referred to as the contaminated release event, occurred on February 14 during the night shift while all staff were on surface. At about 23.13 in the evening, an air monitor underground triggered an alarm. Dampers on the exhaust closed and the facility off operator shifted the exhaust air through the high efficiency particulate fil filters. Personnel initiated the ventilation and radiological alarm procedures and stayed sheltered on surface 
where all were located when the alarm sounded. Notification of radiological control and operations manual, uh, managers and the Department of en Energy representative was completed by 3.30 in, in the morning on February 15. But the regular shift change occurred between 6 and 7 that morning and between 6.30 and 9.15 that morning, the filters on the exhaust monitors before and after the HEPA filters were changed and tested. Contamination was confirmed in the air coming from the underground area and was also detected in the air being released to the environment. By 15.12 in the afternoon of the 15th, non-essential personnel were permitted to leave the site after having been surveyed and at the request of a worker, a bioassay program was initiated. Many of the uh, on-site operations remained halted and planning for re-entry into the underground area subsequently began. Following each of these events, the Department of Energy, or DOE, appointed an accident investigation board to inv investigate the accident. The accident investigation board findings for the fire event were made public in March, and the first report, the phase one report of two planned by the Accident Investigation Board was issued in May. It assessed the release to the environment. There have been delays in completing the event, event investigations due to the need to plan and stage the entry because of the contamination caused by the underground release event. With respect to the fire, the mechanical status of the vehicle was confirmed and over the months since the event, the status of the ground where the fire occurred has been assessed. Soot remains to be cleared in underground areas, some underground areas, and the work is undertaken as areas are reclassified following surveys and sampling for the radiological contamination. With respect to the release event, work to date has confirmed that there was a break in a container in the open waste management panel where the packages were being placed. There is an obvious twisted lid and discoloration on the container, suggesting a chemical reaction from photographs of the area. The inspection of the waste panel is continuing and additional rows of containers are to be examined when a boom and trolley system arrives on site mid this September. The examination of wastes and waste packages at the site where this container was filled is continuing to confirm the process of release. There is some indication that it is associated with organics in the absorbent and other materials in the container, but this is still not confirmed. The phase two report by the investigation board will provide the findings from their investigation on the underground release, but we don't know yet when this report will be made available. Meanwhile, the underground area continues to be surveyed, sampled, and released for occupancy without personal, pardon me, protective personal equipment. Um, these areas then go um, into maintenance activities, including cleaning, and equipment maintenance. Both of the events have been assessed for their possible impact on workers, the public, and the environment by the accident investigation boards. With respect to the fire event, while a number of workers were treated on site, six workers were treated for smoke inhalation in hospital and released the same day. There were no significant injuries that required hospital admittance. The public and the environment were not affected. With respect to the release of radionuclides from the waste panel, six, uh, pardon me, 21 workers were initially reported to be affected at very low levels, and this was later revised to 22 in a May 15th update. All affected workers received doses less than 0 0.1 millisievert. We've uh, converted from the U.S. units, 
and a small fraction of this, which is a small fraction of the dose limit from 50 millisievert per year. The estimated public dose is on the order of 0 0.001 millisievert, and natural background in that area is 3.1 millisievert per year. There were no injuries sustained to workers from this event. There was no contamination of surface water, sediment, or vegetation. CNSC staff reviewed the investigation reports made available to the public by the DOE on the WIP website. There were many observations and recommendations made by these reports, and some of these more important ones are ident were identified by CNSC staff's review and are highlighted in the next slides, along with the requirements of the CNSC in relation to these observations. Starting with the fire, the following observations were made. The maintenance program was not effective in preventing or correcting conditions such as a buildup of combustible material on the vehicle and the inoperable status of some alarms. This program failed to recognize the safety significance of equipment not already identified as related to radioactive waste. The CNSC requires a preventative and corrective maintenance program that considers all risks and hazards in its implementation and management of changes. There should be no automatic separation of importance based solely on its association with the nuclear side of an activity. The fire protection program was not effective. It did not prevent the change to the automatic auto, uh, actu actuation of the vehicle fire suppression system or the amount of combustible material above values in the fire hazard assessment located underground. It also did not address problems with maintaining proper door configurations and some doors were chained open. The CNSC requires an effective fire protection program, one that th complies with the requirements of the National Building Code and Fire Code of Canada and two regulations under the Ontario Occupational Health and Safety Act, which all expect that there will be equipment, personnel and personal training to address operational and emergency needs. This includes the provision of refuge stations and the implementation of stench gas in addition to other alarm events. Neither refuge stations nor the stench gas appear to be, uh, appear from the report to be the requirements of the fire protection program at the WIP facility. The fire hazards assessment was not comprehensive. It did not analyze all credible fire locations. The CNSC requires through conditions of the license that a fire hazard assessment be conducted in the construction phase for the facility design, that the fire hazard assessment be developed from National Fire Protection Association guidance in standard 122 for metal and non-metal mining and standard 801 for facilities handling radioactive materials. That the, uh, it, pardon me, um, through the condition of the license we require that the fire system and other protective features of the facility be reviewed by a third party expert for compliance with the requirements and further the effect of any changes to the design or other protective features that occur in either the construction phase or in opera fa operational phases are expected to be assessed and reviewed by that third party. The CNSC has a fire protection specialist who participates in the review of licensee fire hazard assessments. CNSC inspectors also verify C a licensee compliance with those requirements. Continuing with the fire event, the emergency preparedness and response program was not effective. Actions were taken by operators at the WIP facility that resulted in a change in the direction of air and smoke in the underground. This caused confusion and caused some of the underground workers to not follow their planned route of egress. CNSC requires emergency preparedness and response to conform to best practice during fire events and procedures that result in immediate actions that lead to a change in air direction during a fire are considered flawed. Workers were almost immediately directed to evacuation 
uh, to evacuate, and evacuation was well in progress before the mine rescue teams appeared from the reports to have been activated. Workers at CNSC licensed mines are required by their emergency preparedness response programs to report to strategically located, permanent, or portable refuge stations that are fully equipped with air supply, communication system, and other emergency and personal protective equipment to wait for full instructions and the assistance of mine rescue teams for an orderly evacuation. WIP staff managing and responding to the emergency event took actions based on their experience and knowledge. The procedures were not necessarily followed and decisions were taken without any apparent information or knowledge of conditions underground. CNSC requires the Emergency Preparedness and Response Program to be process and systems based rather than relying on staff to make expert based decisions under stress of event conditions. Taking a process and systems approach develops procedural structures that lead to obtaining the necessary information and then to identify, characterize, and classify the event and engage in well-considered and planned responses. This process of evaluation may occur more than once as conditions change and new information becomes available about the event. Training and the qualification of work workers at WIP was not effective. Some of the observations relate to ineffective training and qualification of staff. They were workers wearing their personal protective equipment ineffectively or not at all. Workers who were uncertain about what actions to take following the alarm. The facility operator also did not fully understand what would happen when the ventilation was reduced and did not follow emergency procedures. CNSC requires the systematic approach to training for all programs, and this includes classroom familiarization with the programs and procedures, drills of procedures, and with equipment to demonstrate competence with equipment and procedures, and large-scale exercises. The qualifications and competencies and the requalification requirements for staff engaged in activities must also be established for various positions. CNSC staff specialists conduct thorough reviews of licensee emergency preparedness and response programs and of their training programs. Licensees emergency prepared and response and training programs are inspected for compliance. The emergency ex exercises that licensees are required to conduct are monitored by CNSC staff. Some of the lessons learned uh, for the contaminant release event are similar to those of the fire event. For example, the inadequacies with existing um, emergency response and preparedness program associated with a lack of process and systems-based approach to event response, and problems with the preventative and corrective maintenance program at this time associated with the continuous air monitoring equipment that was not working or not able to remain operating during the event, along with other equipment like the bypass valves on the ventilation system and the ventilation dampers. Also, the design management and control was not effective. There were changes to the ventilation system with the addition of more fans that changed its operations and the performance of the existing system. This includes the dampers. Design management was not effective in maintaining design control and managing the changes. The management of the safety basis was not effective. The modifications to the design were not effectively assessed in the context of the operational safety of the facility. It also appeared that over time changes were made to the relative importance of various design elements for safety during normal and accident conditions and that these changes affected the defense in depth approach for the facility and its operation. The CNSC requires a management system in accordance with Canadian Standards Association N286. The standard requires 
an integrated safety approach to ensure that the effect of changes are assessed across all programs and so adjustments are fully understood and are made where necessary across the programs to maintain the level of safety across the facility. CNSC staff conduct con detailed reviews of licensee management systems and conduct compliance verification activities to ensure its effectiveness. Further, there was an ineffective radiation protection program in place and those working at the WIP site did not fully understand and characterize the event or control the radiological hazard. The operator of the facility seemed to quickly dismiss the alarm once uh, notified of its malfunction and there appeared to be no further investigation. There was a lack of other available working monitors underground. The technical staff, staff replacing the filter on the monitor did not quickly alert others of his observation of the discoloration so workers could be protected during the shift change. CNSC requires that radiation protection programs include controls for radiological hazards and worker dose, that the program apply ALARA as low as reasonably achievable, and assess performance through monitoring, including training and worker qualifications. Continuing with the contaminant release event, the investigation board discovered that some of the issues and concerns associated with the event were long-standing and repetitive in nature, and there had been a failure to correctly identify problems. The problem with the lack of implementation of corrective actions by contractors was pervasive, and so the management of contractors and contractor operations was clearly not effective. The CNSC requires a management system in accordance with the Canadian standard that provides for adequate contractor management and oversight of contractors and contractor operations. The standard requires the establishment of performance requirements, continual improvement and oversight that includes audits, wis witnessing and surveillance, independent assessment of contractors and the contractors are themselves required to conduct assessments. There was also an unhealthy safety culture. The investigation board identified there was a lack of questioning attitude by workers, a reluctance to bring up and document issues, and general acceptance and normalization of degraded or non-functioning equipment by staff. The CNSC requires that safety be paramount in the working environment at nuclear facilities to encourage workers to challenge assumptions, investigate anomalies, consider the consequences of situations or conditions, and to take action. The CNSC, uh, pardon me, the Canadian Standard N286 includes the recognition and promotion of safety and requires the integration and maintenance of safety in all activities and requires the clearly identified accountability of management and staff the CNSC requirements for safety culture are assessed through reviews of policies and programs, inspections and interviews of staff, and reviews of events and incidents. The lessons learned are valuable operating experience. The CNSC requires licensees to implement operating experience programs known as OPEX to ensure that they become aware of issues or problems experienced by other country, uh, uh, companies engaged in similar activities worldwide so that they can learn from the experience of others, avoid common problems, and improve their own operations. The WIP events have relevant operating experience information for both the construction and operating phases for OPG's DGR. CNSC staff's review of the events, however, did not identify anything new or different in environmental impacts or consequences. The impacts of fire or release of radionuclides from a package has been considered and conservatively assessed by OPG in their EIS. There were no new 
or additional control measures or mitigations identified by the WIP events. Similar control measures were identified and have been considered by OPG in the EIS and in responses to information requests from the JRP. OPG responses demonstrates the EIS conservatively assessed the events and that the public is protected by the proposed DGR project. The OPEX from the WIP events identify the importance of the management system, development and implementation of programs and procedures, maintenance of the safety case and safety culture. It also highlights the importance of contractor control and oversight. CNSC staff have confirmed that OPG and their chief contractor, the NWMO, have management systems that meet the requirements of CSA N286. OPG has the contractor management and oversight, continuing improvement and use of OPEX, plus other tools and practices that are necessary to maintain a healthy safety culture. Okay. It is also important to identify the differences in the regulatory framework between the US and Canada that are relative to the events at the WIP facility. The Department of Energy is the owner and designer of the WIP facility. DOE is also the operator through their use of contractors. DOE is also the regulator, having established many of the regulations that the WIP must comply with. So the DOE implements the regulations that they have established and must demonstrate the adequacy of this implementation to themselves. This is potentially problematic because they, it may be, uh, there may be a lack of impartiality and an inability to separate roles. DOE is the operator and as a regulator must also coordinate and comply with other regulatory bodies. This can cause problems because of the multi-jurisdictional authorities and difficulties within DOE's organization in understanding which role they are engaged in, i.e. being regulated or the regulator cooperating with another regulator. This framework can also make the effective oversight and control of contractors more difficult as there may be differences in expectations of the contractor between DOE, the regulator, and DOE, the operator, managing their contractor. And when problems occur with this type of framework, it can lead to ineffective regulation, an ineffective operation, and a failure of the overall institution to ensure safety. In Canada, OPG is the owner and operator of the proposed DGR. If licensed, OPG is responsible for safety and for ensuring that they and their contractors effectively implement the regulations established by federal and provincial governments and for complying with the licenses and permits issued for the project and for demonstrating this compliance to the regulatory authorities. CNSC is the independent regulatory body with an overall responsibility under the Nuclear Safety and Control Act for regulating the nuclear industry to protect workers, the public, and the environment. This is accomplished by establishing regulations, establishing other requirements through licenses and conditions, assessing the licensee's compliance with these requirements, and stopping unsafe practices through the issuance of orders or by revoking or amending licenses. The CNSC also recognizes that other regulatory authorities have requirements that must be complied with by licensees and through memoranda of understanding and license conditions also ensure, uh, works to ensure this occurs. Canada's independent regulatory framework fits well with the guidance published by the IEA for effective reg regulation of the nuclear industry. CNSC staff also examined OPG's response to the JRP's request for information on the relevance of the WIP events. 
Our review considered CNSC staff's assessments of the events, the related elements that are managed through the application of Canadian nuclear safety standards that will apply to the DGR facility and its operation, and OPG's understanding of the events and their use of operating experience and identification of opportunities for continual improvements to the project. CNSC staff are satisfied with OPG's response. For both the fire and release events, OPG's, uh, OPG identified the key concerns that both events were assessed as credible scenarios in their EIS and related submissions. OPG confirmed the control and mitigation measures identified in the EIS will provide defense in depth, depth and minimize the risk of these accidents occurring. OPG identified the importance of having an effective management system and safety culture and outlined the use of these events as operational experience for both the construction phase and later operational phase. OPG has confirmed they will continue to assess new information on the causes and contributing factors as they become known. OPG indicated they would, when moving forward, incorporated the event information where appropriate into the detailed design of the ventilation system and in fire protection system. The terms of the license require that a comprehensive fire assessment and third-party third reviews be completed on that fire protection system. This will be verified by CNSC staff. With respect to the impact of the events on CNSC staff's previous assessments provided in PMD 13-P1.3, the events do not indicate the need to implement changes to the DGR project. The impacts of the, an accident or malfunction that results in a fire or a release of contaminants has been conservatively assessed and the appropriate control measures and mitigations identified. CNSC staff remain satisfied that such events, uh, events, accidents or malfunctions, uh, if they occur, they would not likely cause significant adverse effects to workers with the proposed controls and mitigations and no on-site or off-site adverse effects to public and the environment were identified. Similarly, with respect to staff's assessment presented in PMD 13, P1.2 on the license application, CNSC staff are satisfied that OPG has an acceptable management system and other programs, such as contra contractor oversight, the use of operating experience, and continual improvements. CNSC staff are satisfied with OPG's plans to continue to be informed through their operating experience program of the causes of the WIP events through all licensing phases. CNSC staff continue to conclude that OPG is qualified and will implement adequate provisions to protect the health and safety of workers, the public, and the environment. This concludes our presentation. Thank you, Ms. Clausen.